Good afternoon. I'm Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's third spring seminar. We welcome the participants who are joining us online through Zoom, as well as the participants who are here with us at the University of Kentucky. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions this afternoon, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions in the chat box if you are online, or you may use your mic. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. Please take a brief moment at the conclusion of the seminar to complete our brief evaluation. This evaluation will be sent to your email address after the seminar. It's really helpful as we plan for upcoming seminars. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay Mullis. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, my name is Lindsay Mullis. I'm the Health and Wellness Director at the Human Development Institute here at the University of Kentucky, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to bring some wonderful people from NICPAD, which is the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability. I am employed through a fantastic grant, lovingly called Project CHEER, which stands for Community Health Education and Exercise Resources, that's in partnership with our Kentucky Division on Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities at the state level, and it's a funding we receive through the CDC's Disability and Health Branch. And so through that, we are excited to partner with NICPAD today to learn more about the wonderful programming that they offer for inclusive health efforts, and to provide those opportunities to you all to learn about those and hopefully implement them and what it is that you're doing within your community efforts as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues at NICPAD. Kelly? Good morning, everyone, or almost afternoon, I guess, for you guys. Um, I'm Kelly Bonner, and I work here at NICPAD, as she said, and I kind of run um, the training components that we do, as well as uh, you'll learn about our different sectors, but I'm, I'm over the world of fitness, recreation, and sport. And with me today is Hi, I'm Carrie Vanderbaum. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, but I work with the UAB Lakeshore Research Collaborative, and so I am the implementation coordinator for NICPAD. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get started, because uh, I know we have a, a quite the lengthy webinar ahead. So just so you guys know who we are, uh, Lindsay already mentioned it, but the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability and really our tagline is just about building healthy, inclusive communities. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. All right, so just to give you an idea about what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna briefly go over um, who NICPAD is and some information about disability and health. Um, in case uh, you're not super familiar with it, but if you are, it's just, it'll be a review. Uh, we're gonna talk about NICPAD both as a resource center and then as a practice center. And we're gonna kind of make it, uh, break, break up the, the talking with just a few activities and a break and then offer some questions and answer time at the very end. All right, so I usually have to start with Nick Pad who, um, because that's usually what you're saying uh, when you come in the room, you're like, what are they, and they know they're pronouncing that wrong, there's an H in there, we know, we get it. Um, but let me talk a little bit about the who first, um, and then hopefully you'll stay awake for the what once you know the why or the who we exist. So, um, the first reason why is because there are 53 million Americans out there with a disability, just like you and me. And I know this because one of the 53 million happens to be my husband. You guys can see him there, isn't he cute? Um, and just like you and me, he struggles with his weight and how to eat right, finding the time um, and knowing the right way to exercise, all those things that everyone struggles with. And he knows his blood pressure is creeping up every year and that he really needs to watch it. His father had a heart attack before age 50, and so he knows that's already working against him as well as the chair. Um, but unlike you or me, he can't just open Men's Health or any other magazine and find the answers for him because they usually don't exist. And he can't even typically join the local gym or participate in the statewide campaign to lose weight because his health information isn't ever included in those types of programs for the most part. So, and he really can't even rely on his doctor sometimes because his primary care physician doesn't always know what type of exercises he should do. Every time he goes in there and his blood pressure is high, they just say, oh, you probably had to push so far to get in here. That's why it's elevated. And they don't take it as a realistic concern. 
So his, he find, he has to seek a lot harder to find that information. Um, but the why doesn't stop there, and neither does his story. So we have a little girl. This picture's old. I should update it. Um, and so for now, he's a stay-at-home dad, and just like all most two and a half year olds, um, ours is wide open. And she likes to be active from the moment she wakes up in the morning to the time she goes to bed. She usually wants to be outside and playing. And while, yes, our backyard is very fun, um, usually a park is more fun. And we know that a park is a great place for families to recreate together. But the park has to be accessible, which isn't always the case. And in our neighborhood, it's not the case. Um, and so he can't take her to the park because by the time he puts through all the mulch and the gravel and over those little plastic barriers that they put around the play area, she would be long gone at 2.5. We're working on obedience. Um, but there's no chance he's taking her to the playground. But that's still not the end of our story because every restaurant, every bathroom, every walking trail, exercise facility, every plane ride we take, every hotel room, what should be just a simple date night turns into a question of is it going to be accessible um, from family vacations to going to the local you know hole in the wall restaurant that everybody's been raving about well the bathroom's not accessible or we can't get in the front door or there's no seating for us um, so someone or someone's parked too close to his car so he can't get back in if you go to the grocery store everyday life uh, opportunities happen that kind of make him realize again and again that he has a disability and that this world isn't truly accessible. So the reason why is because someone just like you and me said, why does inclusion matter to me? Because they don't think it affects them, but it does affect somebody. We don't have anyone with a disability. Most locations will say, oh, we don't have anyone with a disability who uses X and they can fill in the blank with our restaurant, our park, or whatever. But the reason is probably because they can't, they don't have access to your programs and not because they don't want to use their programs. So yes, they may have never seen my husband at our park, but it's because he can't get to the park. Um, and so he's not going to go there. So that's why we exist, because we can help create inclusive gyms, help promotion programs, educate and inform on inclusive playgrounds, share policy and advocacy strategies to affect change for those 53 million Americans. So we are NICPAD and NICPAD stands for um, well, the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability. We were founded in 1999 as a public health practice, and basically we operate as a resource center. So we are funded through the same division um, as Lindsay mentioned earlier through the CDC, and we're one of two national centers, and we'll get to that in just a second. And um, primarily we operate out of our website, which features a variety of resources and services um, that benefit anyone with a disability of any age and any type of, um, whether it's physical, sensory, or and we operate, uh, a few years ago, we moved from Chicago, Illinois, down to Birmingham, Alabama, and we operate within the UAB Lakeshore Research Collaborative. So here's just a glimpse of the disability and health um, division that funds us. And so you guys can kind of see, uh, they fund, so CDC funds two national centers out of our division. And the one is Special Olympics, which you've probably heard of, and the other national center is us, which you've probably never heard of. Um, and so we are the two national centers, and then along with that is 19 states, and so the currently funded states are the ones with stripes on this screen, and so you can see that Kentucky is one of those, and you're one of the newest ones, so we welcome you guys to this program, and glad that you're here, and super excited to get to partner with you guys in this way. Um, we definitely consider all of the 19 states within the program from CDC more of our partners, um, and so we love it when we get to work and interact with them directly. All right, so we're just going to go over some information about disability. Um, and, and for again, for some of you, this might be a review. Um, but really, there's two two models that are really prevalent in, in disability work. Um, whether you're doing health promotion stuff or recreation stuff or, or at a hospital, these the two models are the medical model and the social model. And really, what the medical model says is that the disability is the disability. It is a personal problem, and typically with a medical model, the focus really is on treating or curing. We're going to fix you. Your disability is a problem. We're going to fix you. Okay. The social model looks at disability in a different way, where it is a societal issue. It is a problem located not within the person, but more so in the physical and social environment. And so it really.
works on trying to remove barriers such as uh, anti-discrimination, uh, fixing the physical environment, and what MCAD really focuses on is inclusion of people with disabilities in their communities. So most of you know um, that poor health, it doesn't matter whether you have a disability or not, there's poor health for all people, it doesn't discriminate, right? Um, but for people with disabilities, because we're oftentimes left out of the general health community, um, people with disabilities oftentimes will experience poor health at a greater uh, incidence than um, people without disabilities. Um, and oftentimes people consider health and disability as an oxymoron. So, um, so oftentimes people think disability and health, um, they don't go together. And so if you have a disability, you are unhealthy, but that's not true. Disability is, it's not a health outcome, um, but it's, it's more of a dem demographic or, or a descriptor of someone that they, that a person with a disability may be unhealthy, but they may not, just like anyone else. Um, Kelly already mentioned that there are approximately one in five adults that in the US that live with a disability. So depending on what stats you look at, this could be 18 to 20% of Americans have a disability. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a really large number. And so it, it definitely becomes a major public health issue when you look at the stats where people with disabilities are three times more likely to have heart disease or develop, have a stroke or develop diabetes or have cancer when compared to adults without a disability. And one of the, the stats that we're really interested in related to health is physical activity. And nearly half of all adults with disabilities report that they don't get any aerobic physical activity. And we know this is an important stat to think about because physical activity is an indicator of health. Um, and, and without it, it can lead to other chronic diseases that are preventable. So again, while disability doesn't mean unhealthy, there is a large percentage of people with disabilities that do have poor health. And so Carrie mentioned the impact on the United States. And so now we're going to look specifically on that impact for Kentucky. And so while about 22% of adults in the U.S. have some type of disability, and these numbers are specific to adults, so a little bit different um, than the numbers we just stated, we know that in Kentucky, it's almost 30% of adults have some type of disability. So that number is even higher than the national average. And when we continue to look at the stats for Kentucky versus the United States, we can see that that becomes a trend and that it's higher in all categories. So if you look um, in that first one, you know, folks with, for those with inactive, report being inactive, it's a lot higher. High blood pressure is almost 8% higher for people with disability than without. Smoking, again, significantly higher, almost 13% higher. Um, and then obesity as well. And so we know that these are national trends across the U.S. You can see in, that, in the last category that folks with a disability report all of those to be higher than those about, but for Kentucky, those numbers are even higher, which is a significant impact for your state. Uh, these are the exact same numbers, just in a, in a bar graph, and so you can kind of, some people, you know, visually see it better. And so if you just look at those blue lines across the board, you can tell that for Kentucky, folks with a disability are reporting even higher numbers. And possibly even the most um, striking uh, statistic that we see across your state is that in addition to physical health and secondary conditions, those from disability or those from Kentucky with a disability experience a drastic health disparity with how they rate their health. So those saying those who have a disability in Kentucky would say that they have fair or poor health, which is over 50% of the folks with a disability. That's a huge and staggering number. And when you look at the folks without a disability, only 11% would say that they have fair or poor health. So obviously that's a drastic difference in the two there and something that where your state can actually work in it and Lindsay's gonna jump in and kind of talk about what your state is doing to kind of impact those numbers. Thank you so much, Kelly. And so as I introduced myself, I said that our project is lovingly called Project Cheer. And again, that stands for Community Health Education and Exercise Resources. And so what we're looking to do is address health disparities for individuals with both cognitive and mobility impairments within our state. 
We're looking to do that through education, empowerment, and promoting accessibility. And we're doing that not only at the state level and working with partnering with the Department of Public Health, but then also to at the local level because we recognize that there's a lot of rural locations in Kentucky that have additional barriers that need to be addressed and to um, coming from Kentucky, we have a lot of different silos in our county. So trying to break those down and bring people from the disability community as well as the health community together at the same table to talk about ways that we can uh, accommodate these inequities in health and address where the barriers and accessibility issues are. And to do that, we're promoting universal design strategies. So we have uh, a lot of expertise coming in from um, my department and from self-advocates that we employ that talk about ways to implement universal design strategies in programming and built environment and even just uh, programmatic materials to make sure that it's not just more accessible for individuals with disabilities, but more accessible on a broader scale and a greater sense and just providing inclusive health efforts in that way. And one of the main ways that we are focusing on doing that is by promoting the Health Matters program if anybody's heard me talk before, this is a program that we've been doing across the state for the past four years. It's evidence-based specifically for individuals with intellectual disabilities. And what we're doing is we're taking that and we are now going to incorporate universal design strategies and a Kentucky approach to make it uh, accessible for individuals both with and without disabilities in inclusive community settings. So libraries, public health departments and things like that so that we can bring it all together and make sure that everybody can access this really beneficial health promotion program and uh, we're doing that uh, in a minimum of eight communities across the state over the next three years so a lot of really exciting things coming from Project Cheer and I know there'll be an opportunity for us to take questions later but it's exciting to know that we have some Kentucky focused efforts going on <laughs> within this area and we're excited to be able to learn from Nick Pad's expertise and implement these strategies within our local communities thanks guys all right, so you know we, we're talking about health equity and health disparities, and I think it's really important to um, remind people helps value valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing again that these are, you know, these problems are rooted in injustice, and then being able to provide resources according to need. And so, you know, all the different uh, initiatives and programs that Kentucky is going to be working on, um, hopefully will lead to health equity. I'm so sorry. Uh, your all's mic was muted for the very first 30 to 45 seconds of that um, slide. Do you guys care to make sure that we uh, didn't miss anything? And it was done on, on, our, on the technology side of things, so it wasn't anything that you guys did. But I just wanted to make sure that the audience didn't miss any wonderful content that you guys might have said. No worries. Sorry about that. All, yeah, all, sorry about that. All we were just saying was that um, I think it's really important, you know, when we're talking about health disparities and health equity, um, realizing that the problems are rooted in social injustice issues. And so this, this figure, um, which we borrowed from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, love it, one, because it's inclusive, but I think it really makes it clear, right, that equality is what we see at the top. Um, and, you know, there's different figures I'm sure most of you have seen about, you know, the box and the boxes and the, the kids and adults trying to see over the fence. Um, but this one we like because it's inclusive, um, but showing at the very top that equality, everyone gets a bite, but equity is where it is um, tailored for the person, and so um, it's more equitable. So now everyone can participate together um, and, um, e e I can't say the word, e equitably. <laughs> um, So before we get into um, our definition of what inclusion means, we wanted to take just a few minutes for you to either write or think about what inclusion means to you. How would you define it? Um, maybe you have uh, an example in your head about what it means, um, but just take some time to think about what, what inclusion means to you. 
So we'll give you just a minute or two to write that out and then we'll move on. And we are going to come back to this towards the end. So, so um, if you don't, if you have a brain like mine that works like a sieve, you might want to write it down. <laughs> Especially on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> All right, we'll take 30 more seconds. So this is the way NICPAD defines inclusion. Inclusion means to transform communities based on social justice principles in which all community members are presumed competent, are recruited and welcomed as valued members of their community, fully participate and learn with their peers, and experience reciprocal social relationships. So we're going to talk about um, what some of those barriers are to the inclusion. So she talked about um, fully participating and learning with their peers, they're presumed competent, being recruited and welcomed as valuable members. So it's really about that equity that we just talked about, right? And so when we look at what inclusion means, um, it really can change your focus as to what barriers to inclusion might mean, right? If someone is experiencing the exact same social relationships in a situation or whether they're not able to because they weren't invited to the party. Um, so we're going to look at what some of those might be, particularly when it comes to um, health and wellness programs and that kind of thing. So as you might uh, guess, they did the research and they found that one of the number one barriers to inclusion is uh, architectural. So now, if you don't have a disability yourself or know someone with a disability, you might not even notice that when you walk into a restaurant or if you walk into this lovely restaurant here. Uh, but obviously here, there's not a single low table. These are all high top tables. So anyone with a disability who uses some type of mobility device would really struggle or not even be able to eat at this restaurant. Um, so obviously my family is not going to go to that location. So um, there's also the ADA, um, which would look, prohibit that restaurant from looking like it did, um, but that doesn't always mean that that's the case. And here's another example. This is a, a, obviously a family dollar, a general store um, that's in many locations without a single per pet. So again, my husband's not going to that store because he can't get to that store. Um, and while the ADA has been around for almost 30 years now, which would prohibit this from happening, it still exists. And so those barriers, especially architectural barriers that should be taken care of, it's just not always the case. And so it's still something that they always have to think about. Um, and this lovely one is one of the on, this is right off of one of the entries of an amazingly accessible trail that we have right across our street, except for that it's not accessible. You can't access the accessible trail. Um, so here there's not a curb cut um, to go down or up onto that surface. This part, this route specifically right where they are um, was also included in what a local organization um, marketed as an inclusive 5K. Um, so again, we had to just go back and kind of educate as to what does that really mean? And when we're looking at architecture, you know, where those really, where those barriers really come in. And just because it's on an accessible trail doesn't mean that it's necessarily accessible because they can't get there. Programmatic. Um, when we talk about programmatic, usually this is when we go inside. So architectural barriers tend to refer to the built environment or the outside of the building. And then programmatic barriers refer to what happens once you're inside the building. So can they navigate the space independently? Can they sign in? Can they see flyers or posters? Obviously, the husband would not see anything that was posted on that board right there, and he can't sign in his name or do anything that's required at that check-in desk. So can they navigate that space independently? Or can they use the equipment? So obviously, this is a pretty typical um, fitness facility, and once they get inside, this is the programmatic aspect. Can they access any of the equipment. There are laws that we'll talk about in a minute that require them to have access to this equipment, but obviously, you know, 
wheelchair or a walker or even a cane wouldn't fit between any of those treadmills. Um, and beyond that, you know, what pieces do they have? What pieces of cardio do they have that offer opportunities for them besides just leg opportunities? And does it should look more like this, where folks can access any piece of equipment that they choose? It's not um, the facility making the decision which piece of equipment they have access to, but they're allowing access for the individual to make that decision as to which piece of equipment they might want to use. Just because someone comes in using an assistive device, um, particularly a wheelchair, doesn't mean that they may not want to walk on the treadmill. Maybe they can't walk long distances, so they need to get some activity. Um, and so again, it's not assuming anything and allowing the individual to make that decision. And then the last one is attitudinal barriers. And so we found um, when they did the research that attitudinal, attitudinal barriers are one of the biggest um, complaints of folks with a disability and one of the largest reasons that they don't participate in physical activity. So this is a picture of my husband and I um, at a 5K that we did out in San Diego. And I am very pregnant in this photo, whether you can tell or not, I just think I've placed the numbers really well. But who do you think got more cheers during that 5K? The pregnant chick running for two or my husband? Yes, the correct answer would be my husband. So they automatically assumed that just because he was doing this in a chair, that it was more inspirational or more amazing. I would beg to differ as I was running for two. Um, and of course he blew me away in that race, but the cheers that he got every time we passed folks was ridiculous. Um, and it just shows the attitude of folks uh, just assuming that someone isn't active because they have a disability or they don't choose to be active because they have a disability. Uh, and then this last one is actually uh, a newspaper article from a local business here in, in Birmingham. And what is actually interesting about this article is that there are some folks going around to some local kind of like mom and pop restaurants in the area that are very trendy, local places to eat, um, and they were filing lawsuits because they were not accessible, which is, you know, neither here or there, but the point of the article was that the person writing the piece actually took the side of the restaurant owners, and it was written from a point of, if these people would have just told us, they, we would have made the changes, they didn't have to file a suit. Um, so there's just a really interesting perspective, being that the ADA is 30 years old, and that's like telling the cop, oh, if you would have just told me to slow down, I would have slowed down, you don't have to give me a ticket. Um, sometimes that works, right? Um, but you don't always get out of the ticket. And so it's just a really interesting perspective, and again, shows the attitude of us in the United States of how we just assume, um, you know, what we want to about people with disabilities. And so a very interesting perspective there. And so again, we're gonna, when we're looking at these barriers to inclusion, we I just stated that attitudinal barriers were the most uh, widely reported. And some other examples of attitudinal barriers that folks have are um, negative social responses. So kind of like, oh, why are you out and out? Or um, if my husband goes to the grocery store, they're like, oh, it's so amazing, especially if he takes our two-year-old. A man in a wheelchair and a two-year-old in the grocery store can pretty much get whatever they want. But, you know, here or there, um, they always are like, oh, do you need help getting to your chair? Well, he probably wouldn't have gone to the grocery store if he didn't think he could get back home. He goes to the grocery store because he knows that a happy life is a happy wife, right? Um, uh, unequal treatment and expectations, so just where they are expected. So a lot of 5Ks aren't accessible because people don't assume that they're going to do it. And so that would be unequal treatment or une unequal expectations. Lack of acceptance in whatever social situation it is, you know, if it's a gym or if it's a wellness program, um, they just aren't led to feel welcome. And we'll talk about imaging in a minute, but if you think about all the um, campaigns that are out there that they say things like take more steps, sit less, all of these things that don't include them, you're automatically kind of not accepting them into the program. And then social stigma. So, you know, are the kids on the playground um, inviting? But the kids with other disabilities to play with them, or are they already, you know, ostracized in two different locations because they're not participating in their peer programs because they're pulled out and they're not in their class situations. And just the social stigmas that we start from such a young age, which can carry on throughout life. Whereas if we start, you know, together and people are interacting on a regular basis, then that just transfers into life as well. And so we can kind of change the social stigmas and know that that's um, not what it is. And so to address those issues, 
You can train your staff to make sure that they know first and first terminology and the correct way to refer to someone with a disability. Make sure that you have follow up training so the laws are kind of always changing and just the way that you approach someone may change or you may get new staff. So don't assume that it's a one and done kind of thing. Um, and one that always gets left off, I think, with at, when we're talking about attitudinal barriers is marketing. And so I mentioned that briefly just a second ago, but think about your imaging when you're when you're marketing whatever program it is, whatever, um, if you have a grant, if you're trying to do anything within your community or within your school or your program or your classes, who are you invited to the table and what who does it look like is invited to the table? So, you know, if I said Reebok in the early 2000s, you guys would be like, um, a not so cool athletic brand that we don't see a whole lot anymore. Um, but if I said it today and you guys live in the CrossFit world, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's CrossFit's brand. Have you seen the new Nanas? Um, and so by accepting, by Reebok taking on the CrossFit image, they really changed who they are and who knows who they are. Um, and so it's the same thing. Imaging says a ton. And so we're talking about social media, we're talking about flyers, advertisements. You know, if I look on the images on the screen, there's nothing there that screams someone with a disability is welcome. I can't take the stairs, I can't sit left, it's not really an option, you know, if someone who can't stand. Um, and so what's there for them? Just the same as you and I, when we see something um, advertised, you know, if we're talking about a CrossFit gym and I see that advertised, I'm like, no, thank you, I'm not in that kind of shape anymore and I don't want to be in that kind of shape anymore because that would be really painful to get there. And so I'm not, that. I know that's not something I want. But if I see a gym with a cute little girl in the picture and she's got makeup and she's not sweating at all, then maybe I'm in. Maybe I'll go join that gym because that's about the amount of activity I'm willing to participate in. And so it's all about that image and what it says. Um, and so think about those images that you're doing and how you can make sure that your advertising and your imaging screams that we are inclusive and we want these people at the table with us. Programmatic barriers, the second barrier. So the way that you can address these is one, to make sure that you have equipment that's accessible for folks with a disability. So we already talked about making sure they have access to it, not choosing for them which equipment they can use, but allowing them to choose which pieces of equipment they use. Make sure that your staff is trained to work with people with a disability. So when they come in to the gym or whatever you know wellness program it is, they don't like have this like deer in the headlights kind of look and saying, oh, I I don't know what to do with this person who just came in, but that they're trained and they're welcoming when those folks come in the door. And making sure, obviously, that you have policies in place that uh, assure folks with disabilities are always going to be included. Um, and so those are those programmatic barriers that we can address. And so when you're looking at equipment, we know that there are standards that do exist. So you want to ask, can a wheelchair user easily maneuver or transfer onto the piece of equipment? So in the picture, you can see that it's a push-away chair. The person can choose. To either transfer to that chair that's there or roll it away like it's shown in the picture and pull their own um, device up into there and use the piece of equipment that way. Does resistance equipment allow for very small increments? So if someone can't do the typical five to ten pound in, uh, increases, particularly if we're talking about senior adults um, or someone with just low muscle tone, then you want to see those lower increments on pieces of equipment. Making sure that the handles have a large circumference so that they don't have to have fine grip motor movement to change anything. Um, also allowing them to use their own type of gloves that may clip in if someone doesn't have finger dexterity or gripping capabilities, then they can use something that they may have that would help them adjust to that. Looks like I just got advanced. Maybe I'm not talking fast enough. Can you go back just a little bit? Um, and then just knowing whether you know the numbers are large and easy to read and see uh, being able to uh, make any adjustments that they need to. So this is making sure that once they get inside the fitness facility or the wellness facility that they have access to it. And these are just some of the examples of what you can do. The last one is the first one we talked about earlier, which is architectural barriers. So again, here's our local park and just showing what is not accessible because obviously he's not getting over that big barrier. And so architectural barriers are usually the number one one that we think of um, when it comes to barriers and where that is. So the Department of Justice did adopt a revised standards of the ADA. And so it does affect um, any rec recently it affects re recreational facilities, play areas, and any state and local government facilities. So they all have to abide by these certain regulations. And what that means is that their exercise equipment and machines do have to be accessible. If they have a pool or a sauna, a steam room, all of those have to have some type of access. And you guys may have seen this. If you've been in a hotel recently, all of them now have lifts in their pool. And that is because of these statutes that change um, and made regulations so that people with disabilities
employees always have access. So under Title II, what that might look like is when there's no financial burden exists, then they need to remove those barriers. So as long as it doesn't alter whatever service is offered. So we're not saying if you offer a basketball program, so all of a sudden change it and make it 